Dempster's interpretation of the book of Daniel, emphasizes the dual nature of the text, divided into narrative, chapters 1-6, and visionary, chapters 7-12, components. The narrative portion reflects on the importance of faithfulness to God during exile and persecution, while the visionary part outlines a detailed future for Israel until the end of time, often termed apocalyptic. Dempster argues that the book is not just a standalone piece, but part of a larger storyline that continues from the end of Kings. When viewed in this context, the theme of exile is explicitly resumed, and the book begins to address the destiny of the Israelites in exile. The protection of the people from contamination, idolatry, fire, and wild beasts is not only a theme within the book, but carries broader salvific implications. By connecting the book of Daniel to the larger biblical narrative, Dempster provides a more comprehensive understanding of its role and significance, portraying it as a guide for difficult times and a reflection on the universal salvation of the people of Israel. Also, Dempster's analysis of the book of Daniel in the Tanakh accentuates the echoes of the early chapters of the Bible. He draws attention to the strong temptation of forbidden food, Daniel 1, and the symbolic image of a gigantic human figure in a Babylonian king's dream, Daniel 2. This figure, made of various metals, represents human hubris and is a parody of divine creation. It symbolizes four earthly kingdoms that will be destroyed by God's eternal kingdom. Dempster connects this imagery with other biblical narratives, such as David's defeat of Goliath with a small stone. The rock that destroys the image grows to fill the earth, echoing God's holy mountain in Isaiah, which will become the highest mountain and result in the end of war. The extent of this holy mountain will be the entire earth, and this will occur in the latter days, a phrase loaded with eschatological meaning. Moreover, Dempster affirms the systematic manner in which the book of Daniel brings together passages found in the prophetic books. While Old Testament kingdom oracles foresee cataclysmic upheaval and hope for universal peace, the realization of this is tied to God's teleology. Furthermore, Dempster notes allusions to early biblical chapters, such as the linguistic confusion at Babylon's birth, Genesis 11, 1, 9, and its end, Daniel 5. The fate of Babylon is written on the wall, and only Daniel can understand it. When Daniel is thrown to the lions, they are made subject to him like a second Adam. In addition, Dempster asserts the emphasis on dominion and authority in the first six chapters of Daniel. The rock cut from the mountain represents an eternal kingdom, and various rulers are forced to confess God's eternal dominion. The analysis thus reveals a rich tapestry of connections and themes that link the book of Daniel with other biblical texts and concepts. Further, Dempster's interpretation of Daniel chapter 7 12 in the Bible provides a detailed analysis of the visions and dreams that expand on the Babylonian king's dream of a gigantic image. He likens these visions to a series of paintings, each adding more detail, and draws parallels to the creation story in Genesis. In Daniel 7, Dempster describes a parody of creation, an anti-creation, where four horrifying beasts emerge from the chaotic sea, each more terrifying than the last. These beasts are given authority to rule, with the last one embodying evil and speaking proudly. The scene then shifts to heaven, where a divine judge pronounces a verdict, leading to the end of the beasts and the conferment of all authority to an individual, like a son of man. Dempster notes that this vision parallels the eschatological vision in chapter 2 but adds more detail. He explores the interpretation of the four beasts as four kingdoms, and the kingdom being given to the saints of the Most High. He also delves into the debate over whether the Son of Man is a symbol for the people of Israel or a distinct individual, contending that the Son of Man is intimately associated with the saints, but maintains individuality. Besides, Dempster connects the Son of Man to the wider context of the canon, highlighting his human nature and weakness compared to the beasts. He links the Son of Man to the divine image and the idea of humanity as God's vicegerent of creation, drawing connections to Psalms and the Davidic figure. The Son of Man's authority is not seized through violence but given by God, contrasting with the beasts, and reflecting humanity as it was intended to be. In chapter 8, Dempster adds more detail with another vision representing four successive kingdoms, including Media Persia, Greece, and the Seleucid reign of Antiochus Epiphanes. He interprets the time of oppression as temporary, lasting three and a half years or half of seven years, symbolizing completeness. Overall, Dempster's interpretation of these chapters in Daniel provides a rich and nuanced understanding of the visions drawing connections to other biblical texts and indicating themes of divine authority, human nature, and the contrast between the divine image and its parody. Additionally, Dempster's interpretation of the 70 weeks in the book of Daniel provides a comprehensive blueprint of history, 
focusing on the prophecy found in Daniel 9. He connects the 70 weeks, or 490 years, to the 70-year duration of the Babylonian exile mentioned by Jeremiah. This period is seen as a chronological outline for the future, commencing after the exile and culminating in the kingdom of God. Dempster explains that the 70 weeks will lead to the ultimate jubilee, with specific actions including the end of sin, atonement for wickedness, and the ushering in of everlasting righteousness. The 70th week is marked by the appearance of a Messiah who will be cut off, possibly meaning a vicarious death. This week also includes devastation in Jerusalem and the desecration of the temple. The visions in Daniel add more details, including severe persecution of the saints, desecration of the temple, and the destruction of the enemy. Chapter 10 describes a great war and a final conflict, with eschatological expressions concerning the latter days. The political movements of rulers during the end times are detailed, including conflicts, desecration, and an unparalleled time of persecution leading to a resurrection of humanity. Also, Dempster connects the themes in Daniel to other parts of the Bible, such as the clash between anti-God kingdoms and the kingdom of God, Davidic overtones, and the battle between the serpent and the seed of the woman in Genesis. The imagery of the rock that destroys the image and the son of man to whom all authority is given has connections to the Davidic king and other messianic figures. In sum, Dempster's interpretation of the 70 weeks in Daniel provides a detailed and interconnected view of history, prophecy, and eschatology. It maintains the continuity of themes throughout the Bible and offers a rich understanding of the clash between earthly kingdoms and the divine kingdom, culminating in the ultimate triumph of God's rule. Moreover, Dempster's analysis of the Book of Esther situates it within the larger biblical narrative, pointing out its thematic continuity with the Book of Daniel. Both books deal with the Jewish people's exile and persecution, but while Daniel offers an eschatological framework, Esther focuses on immediate existential threats. The story unfolds in Persia, where a Jewish courtier, Mordecai, refuses to bow to Haman, a high-ranking Persian official. This act of defiance leads Haman to plot the genocide of the Jewish people. Esther, a Jewish woman who has become queen, intervenes to save her people, facilitated by her relationship with Mordecai. Dempster notes that the absence of God's name in Esther doesn't negate the divine orchestration behind the events. The book subtly echoes other biblical themes, such as the enmity between the Jews and the Amalekites, represented by Haman, a descendant of Agog, an Amalekite king. Mordecai, interestingly, is a descendant of Saul, who had spared Agog's life, thus redeeming Saul's lineage through his actions. Furthermore, Dempster draws parallels between the challenges faced by Esther and those faced by other biblical women like Eve, Sarah, and Deborah, who also struggled against oppressive forces. These women's stories collectively represent a larger biblical theology, reiterating the survival and ultimate triumph of the Jewish people and the kingdom of God. Mordecai's exhortation to Esther reflects this theology, suggesting that she has been placed in her position for such a time as this to fulfill a divine purpose. Dempster concludes that Esther is not merely a book about a Jewish festival, but a critical part of the biblical narrative that reinforces the themes of divine providence, the importance of the Jewish nation, and the ultimate triumph of God's kingdom. In addition, in Dempster's analysis of Ezra, Nehemiah, and Chronicles, he repeats the prominence of the concept of the kingdom of God in these final contributions to the biblical canon. Dempster notes that the canonical order of these books diverges from their chronological sequence. While Ezra Nehemiah comes before Chronicles in the canon, it actually narrates events that occur after those in Chronicles. This is likely intentional, as Ezra Nehemiah begins with the decree of Cyrus to restore the temple and return the exiles to Judah, picking up where Chronicles leaves off. However, Dempster underlines that the restoration project described in Ezra Nehemiah is far from triumphant. Despite the encouragement from prophets Haggai and Zechariah, the reality is grim. The people are depicted as compromised, assimilated into pagan culture, and unfaithful to the kingdom of God. Ezra's drastic measure of mass divorce to maintain religious purity, and Nehemiah's struggles with the spiritual and moral laxity of the people, underscore the failure of the restoration movement. Both books end with a focus on the negative impact of mixed marriages, further emphasizing this failure. Dempster suggests that the canonical ordering serves a purpose. It moves from the bleak reality of failed restoration in Ezra Nehemiah to the more hopeful note on which Chronicles ends. This ordering may reflect a deeper theological point, accentuating the kingdom of God as a concept that, while not fully realized, remains a crucial part of the narrative and the hope for the future. Further, 
Dempster dives into the eschatological implications of the Tanakh's ending with the books of Ezra, Nehemiah, and Chronicles. Dempster debates that the Tanakh's conclusion is purposefully open-ended, signaling that the exile of the Israelites is not truly over despite their physical return to the land. He affirms that while Ezra may be seen as a second Moses, he cannot bring about a change in the people's hearts, a transformation that awaits a future day. The exile, according to Dempster, will only truly end when the 70 weeks prophesied in Daniel 9 are completed. Besides, Dempster discusses the significance of the Tanakh ending with Chronicles, which places the modest reforms of Ezra Nehemiah within a grander, cosmic plan that began in Eden. The ending suggests that Israel is still in a state of spiritual exile, even though they have physically returned to the land. Chronicles concludes by linking the decree of Cyrus to the 70 weeks of Daniel and the 70 years of exile in Jeremiah, indicating that the real end of exile will come only with the arrival of the Messiah. In a canonical context, Dempster notes that the command to rebuild the temple after 70 years of exile is directly echoed in Daniel 9. While the 70 years may have concluded, the 70 weeks have just begun, and the people are still in a state of exile. The true emancipation and restoration await the coming of the Messiah, implying a long period of exile still to come. Additionally, Dempster's analysis of Chronicles and the Tanakh, Hebrew Bible, focuses on how the book serves as a clarifying lens for the overarching narrative and goals of biblical history. Chronicles begins with extensive genealogies, starting from Adam and moving through the tribes of Israel, with a particular emphasis on the tribe of Judah and the lineage of David. This focus on genealogy serves to connect the story of Israel back to the broader human story and to assert the significance of David in the divine plan. Chronicles shifts its geographical focus to Jerusalem, particularly the temple, after these genealogies. The temple serves as a symbol of God's presence and the place where all people can come to worship. It is portrayed as the epicenter of a world that is on the path to restoration. However, the sinfulness of the people leads to the destruction of the temple and their exile to Babylon. Despite this setback, the narrative ends on a hopeful note, highlighting that God's plans for restoration through the Davidic line are still in motion. Dempster disputes that the Book of Chronicles serves as a summary and clarification of the Tanakh's larger themes. It indicates that all history is a footnote to David, and that the covenant with David is central to the divine plan for the world. The temple in Jerusalem is portrayed as the future source of blessings, not just for Israel, but for the entire world. The ultimate goal, according to Chronicles, is the establishment of a global house of God, inclusive of all nations, where a new David will proclaim divine law. Last but not least, Dempster discusses the concept of the Davidic house in a dual sense, referring to both a physical dwelling, temple, and a lineage, dynasty. In the Davidic covenant, which is a pivotal point in the biblical narrative, David wishes to construct a temple for Yahweh. However, Yahweh informs David that his son will be the one to build the temple, while Yahweh himself will establish David's dynasty. Dempster maintains the importance of geography and genealogy in this context. The temple is to be built on Mount Zion, located at the middle of the earth, and the dynasty will continue David's lineage. These themes are not just central to the Davidic covenant, but also recur throughout the Hebrew Bible, appearing both in the middle and at the end. For instance, Jehoiakim's release from prison symbolizes the resurrection of the Davidic dynasty, while Cyrus's command to build the temple in Jerusalem signifies the resurrection of the Davidic temple. The Tanakh, therefore, is not just a record of past events, but a narrative that points its readers toward the future. It leaves the story unfinished, suggesting that the period of exile is not the end, but awaits a sequel, a new dawn that will illuminate the entire world. In conclusion, Dempster's interpretation of various books in the Tanakh, including Daniel, Esther, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Chronicles, offers a nuanced understanding of the biblical narrative, pointing out thematic continuity and eschatological implications. In the book of Daniel, Dempster reiterates the dual nature of the text, narrative and visionary, and connects it to the broader biblical storyline, particularly the theme of exile and the destiny of Israel. Also, he explores the book's rich tapestry of connections to other biblical texts, such as the early chapters of Genesis and prophetic books. Dempster's analysis of Esther situates it within the larger narrative of Jewish exile and persecution, repeating divine providence despite the absence of God's name. Moreover, he draws parallels between Esther and other biblical women who faced oppressive forces, reinforcing themes of divine providence and the ultimate triumph of God's kingdom. In his examination of Ezra Nehemiah and Chronicles, 
Dempster focuses on the concept of the kingdom of God, noting that the canonical order serves a theological purpose. Ezra Nehemiah portrays a compromised people, while Chronicles ends on a hopeful note, underlining the kingdom of God as a crucial part of the narrative and future hope. Dempster argues that the Tanakh's conclusion is purposefully open-ended, signaling that the exile is not truly over, and that the true emancipation awaits the coming of the Messiah. Moreover, Dempster digs into the concept of the Davidic house, referring to both a physical dwelling, temple, and a lineage, dynasty. He underscores the importance of geography and genealogy in the Davidic covenant which recur throughout the Hebrew Bible, suggesting that the period of exile is not the end but awaits a sequel, a new dawn that will illuminate the entire world. Overall, Dempster's interpretation provides a comprehensive and interconnected view of history, prophecy, and eschatology, emphasizing the continuity of themes throughout the Bible and offering a rich understanding of the clash between earthly kingdoms and the divine kingdom.